talk some more about Dot and Bubble. It has been interesting to watch how my thoughts on this episode have evolved. And I've been seeing it like in real time, just how my thoughts on this episode have changed. Uh, part of it is the more I thought about it. Part of it is watching a couple scenes from the episode again. Part of it is hearing other people talk about it and seeing their reviews. Because sometimes somebody will say something, you're like, point, I like that, didn't think about that. Um, and it's interesting because this is a very polarizing episode for me. And I mean polarizing in the actual proper definition of the word, where it leaves me very divided. Because there are things this episode does so well. But then there are things about this episode that just drive me crazy. Part of it's just because they push my little buttons of things that annoy me. They just press that button. Um, first off, I love the points it's trying to make and the points it gets across. And it ex the fact it is able to execute so many of these points, so much satire that it's doing, uh, and pull them off effectively and pull them off in this undertone way all the way up to the end in some cases uh, is fascinating and very well done. Um, because it is making points and taking shots at so many different things. You can say it's taking shots at Gen Z. You can say it's taking shots at millennials if you want. And, and those are very much true. It's very ambiguous sometimes about exactly what it's poking the fun at. Not always. We'll get to that. But it's very ambiguous about it. Um, it very much is, of course, uh, saying, you know, everyone lives in their... Not everyone, but some people uh, do have this bad habit of living in their own bubble, refusing to look at the world around them. I touched on that in that interview. And that, that I mean, it's really very on the nose about that. Um, it also does a really good job of showing the dangers of classism and elitism because we do find out over the course of the story that this is kind of the rich snobby brats you know 17 to 27 the people who've never had to deal with responsibility like in real life when you mean an 18 or 19 year old who comes from a wealthy family they've never had their first job they don't quite know how the world works uh so you run into that these people who they they i'm sure everyone has met these people where you listen to them talk and you think to yourself, oh, the real world is going to hit them like a ton of bricks. The real world is going to wake them up and open their eyes one day. We've all done that. When you get a certain age, you're going to hear an 18-year-old talk and be like, oh, you are in for a rude awakening. And I'm not saying everyone that age is like that. I mean, I know some 18-year-olds who are shark tacks. I know some 50-year-olds who are dumb as dirt. But I'm generalizing. It does a good job of... of, of putting that on display. It does a really good job of showing the dangers of elitism. And that is part of what it is. Like throughout a lot of the episodes, when he's, when she's talking down to the doctor and Ruby, I see that as elitism. We're the upper class. We're the rich people. Why are you on our line? Why are you here? And it is still, even though we find out there are other reasons for that later, it is still uh, satire and elitism to the extreme. And how some of these people who live in their own bubble and uh, who have never had to learn to fend for themselves, the fact she can't even walk without the bubble, that she can't even walk without mommy and daddy's money, uh, is taking, it's doing what satire does, taking something and stretching it to the long extreme. And then, of course, the end of the episode, when we actually find out, and this is played so well throughout the episode, that this group are very much racist. Very racist, white supremacist level of racist. Let's, let's not beat around the bush with it. They are. And what impresses me is that this is executed so well. I didn't even click this, even at the end, because I was still so focused on the elitism and classism side of it. That's what I was seeing in my head. Uh, it wasn't until after I watched it, because if you go back and watch my initial reaction right after I finished it, I don't think I even bring up race. It didn't click to me until later, especially when I started seeing other people pointing it out. I'm like, that's not right, is it? And I started thinking about it. I started re-watching clips. I was like, ah. And then I realized it should have clicked earlier. And it might would have on that reaction if it hadn't been for the fact that I was very tired when I reacted to it because I'd worked all day Friday and I wanted to react to it that night. I didn't feel like waiting till the next day. So you could probably tell in that initial review uh, or if you're one of my patrons, the reaction, I, I was a bit distracted, I was very tired, uh, that it probably would have clicked in my head. And then when you go back and think about other moments in the episode, you can see that. 
And it's like, it's never one instance of it where you're like, I should have had it there. It's all the little instances that form pieces of the puzzle. When you start putting them all together, they go. The fact that when the doctor first pops up, she kind of just immediately dismisses him. Whereas Ruby, she doesn't want to talk to Ruby, but she at least listens. And then when Ruby, who also is more her generation, uh, compliments her top, she kind of gives her a little leeway. So even though while she's insulting her, calling her stupid and whatever, she's still keeping her on the line. Whereas the doctor, she doesn't really listen to much. Another big example and it, it struck me as odd at the time, but I didn't get why, it was when she realizes Ruby and the doctor are in the same room. And she treats it as a betrayal, specifically from Ruby, now that I think about it. Y'all are in the same room. You lied to me. And I realized that was odd, and I couldn't figure out why she was quite so upset about it. It wasn't until the ending, and I started thinking about it. I'm like, that's why. Uh, now, part of the reasons it didn't click in my head is I didn't realize just how bad of a person Lindy was um part of this is because uh lindy it like lindy is immediately unlikable to me i've talked about this before the blonde hair the way she acts those are the kind of people that are great on me to begin with uh so i always found her unlikable but it was in that kind of naive rich spoily brat stuck up self-centered valley girl type way that i found her unlikable it's just the kind of person i don't like uh, and I figured, much like other stories and TV shows, you know, she'd kind of go on her hero's journey, at least to some degree, and learn to grow as a person. And we kind of see her, what we think, doing that in parts. Like when she learns to walk on her own, her first hug with, with um, Richard or whatever his name is. I can never remember that guy's name. Uh, when she first hugs him and holds hand you know we kind of see her we think growing as a person it's not until she leaves him to die and gets him killed we realize and i didn't see that coming this episode really does twist and turn a lot in good places this episode really does keep you on your feet even though it's paced a bit slow in places i'll get to that it, it is constantly going in directions i don't expect it to go and that fascinates me so when she actually does leave him to die and he gets killed and she just kind of <laughs> She's going so out of her way to get him killed. I'm, wow. You know, you start to realize there's no redemption for this character. But when you get to that ending scene with the Doctor, which is perfect. Perfect. That ending scene, no notes. No notes. It's perfect. Uh, when you get there, and then she, first she's pretending, like, how she just flat out lies about Richard, or whatever his name is. He said, oh, he's a wonderful man. He went back to save others and she's putting on that fake smile for the doctor. And then we get the dialogue about, oh, no, not, not with you, sir. No, no. And she's saying, sir, in this kind of patronizing way, kind of. Uh, we can't. We, on, on screen, maybe, but in person. Oh, no, no, no. Because you, sir, are not one of us. That's impossible. <laughs> and then the other lady mentioning magic. That's like voodoo. And I, I didn't even click the voodoo thing. I probably should have. I didn't until it was pointed out to me, to be fair. Uh, just immediately what's going on. And that, the fact that it is able to keep all of that to where I think most people aren't going to click it until the end. That these people are just very racist, white supremacist level of racist uh, I think that's very intelligent writing because all the signs are there if you put them together. But I think so many people are going to be caught up in all of the other things that the episode is saying, how it's talking about uh, the over-reliance on social media, being caught in a bubble of social media, the classism, the elitism, which racism is a form of elitism, let's be honest, that you might miss that because the episode is already dealing with so many political topics that you could not click that one. But that is... Again, possibly the primary one. Now, I don't think the others are red herrings. I don't. I don't think they're meant to just divert your attention away. I do think the episode is making points and a satire about all of those other things as well. This is an episode that is just doing so many things and making so many points and pulling all of them off very well. I was very pleased by... Uh, how they handled all of this. Because I am one of these people. I was very worried that this season 
was going to do an episode where they were going to bring race into it. And I really didn't want that. I'm one of these people, especially white supremacist stuff. I just, I kind of roll my eyes sometimes. I just, I get so frustrated with it. Rosa frustrates me on so many levels. Um, even though it's, I'm not saying it's a bad episode, but I do have issues with it. I've talked about it before. Probably the most racist episode of Doctor Who I've ever seen, aside from that ad lib and toy maker, um, which was an ad lib, but definitely shouldn't be in there. Um, but I have no issues with it here. It's pulled off. I love Russell's decision to, instead of setting that in the past, which would have been the easy answer, and I think what most of us expected if they did that, we would have been, we would have inspected, expected it in the Beatles episode or the Rogue episode. The fact, instead, they set it so far in the future, and these might not even be humans, These this group of people. They could be aliens who look human, like the Doctor is. Uh, matter of fact, the one scene at the beginning when she's walking past and we just see the legs get drug away, there's some green slime on the ground, which could be blood. I mean, it could be the sloths, little ooze they leave as they go by. Because they're slimy. But that could be, these people could just have green blood. So they might not be human at all. So putting this in a colony, especially since we know the home planet is probably not Earth, this could be a totally different race that just looks human. Uh, putting it in the future, I feel like it's not, I don't feel like it's picking at anyone. I feel like it's just making a point. I love the decision to send it to the future. And I don't, it's not done in any kind of lecturing tone. It's not done in any kind of patronizing way. It's not done in any kind of condescending way. I don't feel like I'm being talked down to. I feel like the episode is, is using what it's doing to prove several points or to make several points and it's pulling them off. This is something I'm like, yep, this is, yep, they're racist. They're white supremacists. That's what they are. And I have no problems with how they did that. It's like, this is teaching a lesson. This is an important lesson and no notes. And I love Millie and Shooty's performances and the, the, the guest cast in that scene too. C Callie, is that her name? Is doing a great job playing this unlikable character. Hats off to her. But Shooty's response, how he is begging them to let him save them. You know what? I don't care what you think of me. Let me save your life. I love that. That is just amazing. You will die! out there and I can save your lives and then when they won't and he does that little laugh when he's I, I love how this doctor reacts differently to things I've talked about that before I love his reaction and how he doesn't react the way most people would to that because he's not human I think he's the first doctor since Tom Baker to emotionally react in a non-human way maybe Sylvester McCoy to an extent too but Tom very much didn't react to things the way a human would. And I like that Shooty's like that. <laughs> <laughs> Although I did like how he went from the laugh to the... <laughs> that I do get. How he starts to laugh and then he gets into that frustrated, just that kind of yell he does, that I've been in. I have been there in my life where I've been so frustrated by some event in my life where I just, ah, I get it. I've had breakups like that. I, I was in a car accident like that. I had a very beautiful Mustang that a lady on the interstate clank, slammed over and basically knocked me off the road. And the frustration of having to go through all the things you have to do to when your car is total and you're dealing with insurance and the other person doesn't have insurance. Just, just the frustrations of life. I have felt that kind of frustration where I was just... So his reaction there really clicked with me. Um, perfect performance. No notes with that. Uh, my biggest problems with the episode, because I did say I had problems with the episode, is some of the pacing. At 43 minutes, it still feels like it drags. I can get through Inferno easier. I love Inferno. It's my third favorite story of all time. But even at seven parts, it's paced way better than this is. Inferno at seven parts never drags, ever. It is like juggling seven balls and it's never missing a beat. It's perfectly paced, perfectly, um, for seven parts. Whereas this at 43 minutes drags. Part of it is... Watching Lindy take forever to do something, watching her take forever to turn her head, 
forever when they're telling her to do something, forever to stand up, forever to walk. And I get that's the point. She's meant to be unlikable. She's meant to be, it's satire, it's stretching stuff. I get that that's done on purpose. That doesn't make it any less annoying. It's like, it's like when you meet someone who is very annoying and then you find out they're doing it on purpose, they're purposely being annoying. That doesn't make me any less likely wanting to hit them in the face. Actually, that makes me far more likely to want to hit them in the face. Now, that's not a perfect analogy, but the point is, finding, knowing they're doing it on purpose doesn't make it any less annoying to me. Is that something I hate when I'm sitting here going, come on, let's go, let's move. If you, I mean, if you, if you see my actual reaction, and I think I even added a clip of that into the original review of me from my reaction, when I'm like, let's go already. You know, the part when she's, all the slugs are there and she's forward, forward, and then it's right here and she's like, eh, before Ricky shows up and has to talk her through it. And I'm sitting here going, do, 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 do. Yeah, there are parts of it. The part when they're pressing in the codes, I feel like that could be trimmed down. I feel like you could trim five minutes off this episode. Five or six minutes. Maybe not that much. Four to six minutes off this episode, and it would run better. Even though it would only be five minutes off, it would feel like 15 minutes off in a good way. Uh, I really feel like that would tighten up the pacing without bothering me. And then there is the color choices. The saturation of it bothers my eyes. Again, I get this is done on purpose, but it's interesting when you look at the behind the scenes of when they're filming it. Uh, now, of course, I can't watch Unleashed. I'm in the States, but luckily some awesome people do put up clips from Unleashed on YouTube. And when you see them filming back scene or interviews with Callie, the robe she's wearing is a more lavender color and her hair does look a more dirty blonde. And you can tell that that's what it looked like when they filmed but then somewhere in post, they change the color. So her robe looks blue. Her hair looks very blonde. They change the saturation of the colors. It's quite strong there. There was no way it was going to be peaceful and sunny and all those things. So what we decided to do was... And I much prefer the original look of the colors, honestly. Like if it actually looked normal, like if they took all of their little color filtering off and I just saw the footage normal, I have a feeling I would like it a lot better. The actual filtering they do with those colors... It gives me a headache just looking at it. It's just an eyesore to me. And I get they're doing it to make it look like this little idyllic place with slugs running around. And I, I get for some people that might be campy and funny, but the comedy of this does not land for me, let me be clear. Whatever comedy is supposed to be going on here for the most part does not land for me at all. Um, I don't find this campy or humorous. So the, I know some people see some of that in it. That doesn't land for me. Uh, but the problem is those things that annoy me really annoy me because I wanted to rewatch the episode. I have rewatched scenes from the episode, but I haven't rewatched the episode because I feel like it would be a slog to get through. And this is coming from someone who just recently rewatched The Seeds of Death, six parts, The Reign of Terror, six parts, and The Web of Fear, six parts, no problem. I'll take little breaks, I'll get through them, they're fine. Meanwhile, this 43 episode, I dread watching the whole thing because my goodness, I would be bored until you know, nine tenths of the way through it where it gets really good, even though it has some good stuff going on in it as well. So while I love the points it's making, I love how well it pulls off those points. I have not seen a Doctor Who episode pull off talking about racism, classism, and elitism this well since The Mutants, which I talked about in my original review, review. The Mutants is another underrated episode from the third Doctor era, season nine. Very good episode, very underrated. But it deals with racism and classism and elitism as well. Even though it's, it's subtly done, well, to a degree. Uh, I think some people would find it more, some, more subtle than others. Like the little transporter areas where people can beam up and down from the planet. It, it's segregated where one group uses this one, one group uses this one. And it's one of those things when you see it, you're like, I see what you're doing there. Um, so I love that. And not just that. The things it says about social media, the over-reliance on social media, how how much in people's life that is on social media. And it's not lost on me that a, a Doctor Who episode that is satiring overuse of social media, one of the first things we do after watching it is go get on social media and talk about it. That is not lost on me. But that is pulled off very, very well. The performances are so good. Shudigawa 
is a fantastic doctor. I am loving him so far. I very much see why he was cast in the role. He is doing a great job continuing the legacy of the doctor. I really like him. Millie Gibson, very good as the companion in this, very much carrying her own weight. Very impressive performances, considering she was only 18 years old when she filmed this. Very impressive. And this is from someone who is theatrically trained. Um, and then the guest cast are putting in good performances. It's just those little things. The, the, again, the use of colors I don't like and the pacing issues I have with some things taking too long and just frustrating me. Those are just huge pet peeves I have. So I can't overlook that to the point where I don't... I can't get through a rewatch of the story right now. I will eventually, but just not right now. Um, now, one thing I know some people have been talking about is um, why... Now, the slugs had to have been created by the dots. Um, because it wouldn't make sense for the slugs to be killing people in alphabetical order. So I'm sure the dots are controlling them. Now, the interesting thing for me is... While it would have been easier just for the dots to have them kill them whenever it was convenient, I like the fact they're doing it in alphabetical order because it makes sense for the dots to do that. To the dots, for an AI. Now, one thing is odd, and I've heard people bring up, is when the dot attacks Libby and it ends up killing Richard or whatever his name is when it pops him in the head. Well, why didn't they just do that? It's probably because the dots didn't think to do that ahead of time. It, that was probably the dots thinking out of desperation there because it realized, hey, she's on to us. So it had probably never occurred to the dots to do that because we have to remember the dots are a are computers, whether they're fully sentient AI, full AIs, or whether they're just more VIs or something like in Mass Effect. Uh, they're only going to know, they're going to think about things the way a computer does. The closest analogy I can think of is Destiny of the Daleks and the stalemate between the Daleks and the Movellans. Because let's be honest, the Daleks are treated more like robots in that story than they are actual Daleks. But even if you want to just say, well, they're both just being extremely, extremely, extremely logical. You know, to the Movellans and to the Daleks, this stalemate they have going where they're waiting on the other to make the first mistake seems logical and makes sense to them. But the Doctor immediately finds, sees the problem, so does Davros. They see right off why that moment will never come and why they're locked in this stalemate and why it's never going to get anywhere. Because they're human. They don't just think robotically or like a computer or just fully logically. And that, that's kind of like how that is here. The dots don't see the flaw to their plan because they can't see that. They have this narrow way of thinking that a computer does. And to them, that is the logical way for the dots to perform this murder spree where they're killing everybody in alphabetical order. That's why they're doing it with the slugs instead of attacking all of them like they are Lindy right there at the end and Richard, whatever his name is, right there at the end. Um... Because the the idea of killing them any other way doesn't occur to the dots because they're computers. Whereas, obviously, to us, we're like, there are so many easier ways to do that. And I love the fact, and another YouTuber, uh, Vera, on her channel actually brought this up, too, and I have to, I have to agree, uh, is that the dots are doing this because they hate the people. that They have gained some level of sentience. And as the doctor points out, I think they hate you. They're not doing it because they're, they've are they reached some logical conclusion, like, say, Skynet or something, that humans are bad. We must destroy them. They are part of the problem. Or, or Mass Effect. They literally, on some level, almost emotionally hate them. They're annoyed by them because they're unlikable people. I don't like them as an audience member. Immediately, I don't like these people. I find them annoying. And the dots have to deal with them every single day. Even the dots have been like... Enough. And, um, even the dots are just are ready to pull their hair out if they had hair. I love that. I think that is executed so well. So well. And uh, I just love that that's different than the trope we normally see for that. And I definitely had to talk about that as well. Actually, I think I want to go back and rewatch The Mutants, even though that's a six-parter, but it's paced better than this. And maybe do a comparison between it and Mutants. That would be fun. So, polarizing episode. I like it, and in some ways I don't like it. I don't quite know how to rate it. I really don't. 
It's been really interesting watching my opinion of this episode change so much just in real time over the past few days. I'm recording this on Monday. The episode aired on Friday. This is Monday, so I watched it that night. So less than what, three days later, uh, just how much this episode has changed. Even just in the course of the reviews, you can see the initial review where I think I might, the way I started off was this is dreadful to the review I actually gave afterwards, which was filmed, I think, Saturday, where I, my opinion had already changed on the song, to where my opinion is on it now. I'm, it's going to be interesting when I do get to around rewatching this episode, maybe after all of the seasons aired sometime during the summer, and seeing my thoughts on it then and how they've changed. So, Dot and Bubble, what do you think of it? Uh, comment down below and let me know. Don't forget to click the like button and the subscribe button as well. I also have a Patreon if you would like to support what I do, get early access to videos, vote in polls for reviews and all sorts of other goodies. Check that out. There is a link to that down in the description below. I want to give a shout out to some of my top tier patrons, Stephen Crane, Colin Coney, and Finn Perkins. I appreciate their support as I do the support of all of my patrons. It's very much appreciated. I also have a PO box if there's anything you'd like to send me to look at and review. I have a link to my Amazon wish list as well, and a link to my Amazon UK wish list is also down there. Most importantly, thank you for watching.